There we go. Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome to this week's Tipple with Strong Wine Tasting, Virtual Wine Tasting. This is Jeff and Elizabeth Vaudre, the owners of Truth and Wine in Gainesville, Florida. And this week, we're going to be drinking the Astrolabe Pinot Noir from Marlboro, New Zealand. Really, really delicious wine. Um, recent 91 point rating from Wilford Wong. And uh, yeah, let's go ahead and go to the slide. Uh, this is a Pinot, so great pairings are the ultimate to me. Oh, sorry. <laughs> The, uh, the ultimate pairing to me is duck. I happen to adore duck. And then salmon. I love salmon. So those are my two favorites there. Uh, roast pork, smoked fish and meat, mushroom ravioli. I thought sounded particularly fantastic with this guy. So um, if you have not already, let's go ahead and crack Can open. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Just because of what what's here and, and it's a red. Yes. So could you do like other fish, like, like predators? Mm -hmm. Sharks and yeah, they said basically any fatty fish. So I would okay. assume you would go northern fish. Um, so um, I think uh, maybe swordfish would work. Okay. Um, swordfish, yeah. Like cod and halibut, though. So it has to be those meatier fish. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sea bass, maybe. Maybe sea bass. It's white, but it's a little heavy. Maybe uh, probably monkfish. Okay. Yeah, that's an oily fish. Yeah, we wow. made salmon for it tonight, so it's perfect. perfect. Nice. Uh, yeah, let's go ahead and uh, go back to it. Okay. All right, so. Hey, Brenda. Brenda hey. Hey. All right, so if you haven't already, let's go ahead and crack it open. Um, Jerry's already drinking. Oh. <laughs> we got to let it breathe, you know. Got to let it breathe. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, like I always say, I like to bring these down to about 65 degrees. I throw it in the refrigerator for about 30 minutes. And I think with the you know with the lighter, easier drinking Pinot, it's almost even more important. Beautiful ruby color. I could say garnet, but that would remind me of Tallahassee too much. So yeah, uh, it is garnet. Mm, give it a little snip. Nice earth jumping right out of there. Bright cherries. Mm, and a little smokiness. Mm. Mm. Tannins are modest. Tannins, tannins are modest, but definitely present. I mean, it's got, it definitely has good structure. It stands up on your tongue, so to speak. Fresh. It is not flabby. Where's What do you think, Judy? I see her thinking. It's really cold. Yeah, I think we chilled it a little bit too long. Oh, dear. It'll, it'll open up. Yeah. Warm it up with your yeah. That's the ultimate thing. Right? If you get out too cold, do that and swirl, and it will take 10 minutes off of the warm up process. Yeah, it's sat. She did good. She put it in the fridge, but I think it sat there for too long. So it's like, it's more like a white wine chill right now. Mm. Ah. Don't let Kiwi do anything. <laughs> it's all right. You'll, you'll get more of an evolution as we go through it. As it warms up, because you're probably not getting this right now, you guys are probably tasting just the tart cherry. Yeah. Probably not getting a lot of the spiciness because all that needs to relax into a little warm. Yeah. It's more like juice, like, to be honest, like right now. Oh, really? So. Oh. That was my face. Quite a bit of earthiness. Yeah, there, okay. there's, there's significant earthiness to this, um, which comes with that cooler growth. But we, we can talk about that as we move forward. Um, they, they use a nice amount of oak on this, but not a ton. So you get a spiciness, but it leaves, because the earthiness comes from the fruit, not from the barrel. So their sparing use of oak in here allows the expression of mar Marlboro terroir. Mar 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 Marlboro being where it was grown. Okay. And Tiroir being the combination of weather and time of year. Okay. It's a French expression for the all of them. So, mm -hmm. Along with the way that you take the grapes. Okay. It's um it's 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 an expression that has a lot involved in it. Hey Kiwi, what's up? So I'm looking at the label 
and it mm -hmm. says contains sulfites. Is that normally written on a label for um, wine? It, it depends on the wine maker or the wine region. So in this okay. case, New Zealand requires them to say that. So, so let people know that it contains. I was about to ask, is that a government? Some people like, don't thing? have different experiences with sulfite and wine. Is that correct? Right. Sulfites help preserve the wine, and okay. sulfites are naturally occurring. But right. there's also an amount. Sometimes people add sulfites to help the wine preserve even longer. Mm -hmm. For those who, now, some people are sensitive to sulfites, and it will give them headaches. My mom. Right. My mom's like she, she's very sensitive to them. Right. So my dad can drink the Italian wines because they don't. Have so what the Italians yeah. tend to do is not an exclusive, but it, it is. M almost exclusively, is the Italians don't add extra sulfites. It's only the sulfites that came up from the ground. Mm -hmm. The French add a ton of sulfites okay. because they want their wines to last a little longer and age because they really, really, really believe and try to make almost all their wines ageable. So that's true mm -hmm. for both red and white wine in France. They add sulfites to both? No, it's mostly the red. They do add sulfites okay. to both, but the, the, sulfite, the higher sulfite levels are almost exclusively in red. Okay, because it used to be that the reds were what caused him migraines mm -hmm. until he started drinking red Italians. But you. Well, and so. part of the reason for that, too, is that whites generally are not meant to be aged as long as reds, mm -hmm. so they don't worry about the sulfite. Okay. They're, you know, whites are generally meant to be consumed three to five years. Okay. And so that's, that's obtainable. Now, since this has a cell enclosure, does that mean that it's not an ageable one? All right, well, we should talk about that. So this okay. was a screw top wine, but um, I loved it. It always had a little, a little doodad on it. The wax mm -hmm. top? Oh, that's just on the inside of the cap. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that was on the inside. I was right. so excited. <laughs> actually, you know what? Well, I didn't have to... anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah, actually, Kiwi, you got the lucky cap because mine doesn't have that. <laughs> my yeah, Larson well, have that. No, we don't have that. <laughs> I was so excited. I was like, it's right. the second opening. So that's our goal. <laughs> to be behind the scenes tour of Tipples now. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's interesting. You get to see the secret brewery. <laughs> you know what that looks like is um, they did a uh, they did a little bit of onion. Yeah, it absorbs um, oxygen in order mm -hmm. to help it age uh, yeah. to keep so it from oxidizing. Oh. But um, I don't know on that one. I'm not sure why you got the magic. Put it all back on there. The golden ticket. But, um, <laughs> so the Stelvin enclosure. So a screw top, the, the, the true name, the wine name for a screw top is a Stelvin enclosure. And a what? Stelvin. S-T-E-L-V-I-N. Yeah. Stelvin, Stelvin enclosure. And it doesn't mean low level quality. Um, that's what a lot of people think of it as, um, but it really does not mean that, especially when you get to Australia and New Zealand, because they are all about the Stelvin enclosure. The advantages of the Stelvin is you never have bad corks. So mm -hmm. there, a lot of the winemakers lose up to 10% of their bottled wine after they've gone through all the trouble of making good wine. They get 10% bad corks and they get 10% bad wine and it, the only person that knows it's bad is the customer. So it's, it's discovered at the worst possible time. So then there are options you can do. You can use synthetic cork, which is a really good option because it breathes like real cork and doesn't tend to have the corking issues because it's not a natural material. Uh, and then you got the other guys to say, forget all this, this is stupid, stealth enclosure. Boom, done. Um, you never have an issue with the wine going bad. Now, the argument against Selvin enclosures, because nothing can be without discussion in the wine world, <laughs> uh, is the argument against it is that it doesn't allow any breathing of the wine and therefore prevents it from aging. Well. Hmm. But if you have even a good wine, because let's face it, almost nobody actually ages wine. It's about 98%. 98% of wine purchases, purchases are consumed within one hour of purchase. Wow. <laughs> really? Wow. Oh. Yeah. We're young. We're 23, 24. Like, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, people aren't buying the bottles to stick it on their shelf. and the, the vast majority of people just are not doing that. And so that's a good argument to say, well, just go stove an enclosure. The other side of it is now they've been doing more research, and they are finding that 
with the amount of oxygen that is bottled with it, it tends to be more important than they originally believed that almost all of that aging is done from what is enclosed to begin with and not what really seeps in through the natural pore. So and the so natural pore is not doing anything. Right, so what they're really finding is, yeah, there's, there's an aspect there. Maybe if you're going to go 30 years, but even up to 10 years, they're almost seeing no difference. And so they're saying most people, if they stretch it, each wine 10 years. And that's still working well in the Stelvin enclosure. So Stelvins are gaining more and more popularity all the time. And I like to keep talking about it because I do want to be part of that group that helps people understand that just because it's a screw top doesn't mean it's crowding around. Well, we and until you said that, that's exactly what I thought was. Mm -hmm. I thought it was white wines had this, and then it was a, if it was like a under twenty dollar red. I'm not with this. him. And then, but then we also we, we've got some lately that have the synthetic cork, mm -hmm. but then yeah. and also later too, we've gotten a lot that have the real cork and it's broken apart in our hands. It's like yeah, right. Well, that's, you're right. The because um, we have that beautiful um, Cabernet Sauvignon from Sonoma in the store right now. Um, is that the one I love, the Creo? Yes, the Creo. And gorgeous wine, 11 years in the bottle, and the corks are snapping like crazy. Um, the wine is fine, but now you have to go through the extra steps of opening an older cork, which I've been showing some people how to do that, and you can get it done. But I've done it three times. Thank you. <laughs> Kiwi. <laughs> so um, we do have a wine that has a stove in the range. Yes. At least yeah, we do have yeah. it's a it's a high end single vineyard Pinot Noir from Oregon, mm -hmm. Willamette. Yeah. yeah, and we are we're aging it. It's 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 going to be great. Mm -hmm. I, I won't go beyond ten years. So um, wines that winemakers age. deal like they label as like their higher end prime vintages, they are using these now. There are there are some. Like so Oregon is a lot like New Zealand and uh, Australia, where Oregon's using many more Stelvin enclosures and many more. Um, artificial corks. Like, uh, in the so speaking of Pinots, we have a really great producer called Ken Wright, beautiful Willamette Oregonian Pinot Noir. And we're talking, they start around $65 a bottle. So this is nice stuff. And it's all synthetic corks because he was tired of having wine returned to him that had spoiled. And he said 10% of this wine, it, it, to him, every drop is dear because he's making wine. Mm -hmm. So you'd have to buy that wine back or whatever, and then like yeah, he, he what happens is it, it's a whole domino effect where you if you get someone like me, I'm pushing on my distributor, the distributor pushes on them, they push on their cork maker, and who knows where it stops. It usually stops with me. <laughs> <laughs> well, when the bucket always stops with you. So. Yeah, right. Uh -huh. So do you think not only has this made, truthfully, you go to I don't know. I think a twist off top is actually more convenient if you don't have be somewhere where you don't have a wine key, like a hotel. So, you know, it's not all hotel will have a wine key accessible. You have to go down the lobby. But do you think there's been less lost revenue since it's much better now for the winery itself, since you're not having that overhead of 10%? Yeah, oh, for sure. It's, it's helping their bottom line because the Stelvin That's enclosure, awesome. it costs less. And then they're also not getting spoilage sent back. And then think about you're someone like um, Astrolabe, who is, but we'll talk about this, it's a family owned winery and they're sending wine all around the world. And if you have spoilage and money being requested back from the United States all the way back to New Zealand, that's, a, it, that's hard for them. Yeah. Yeah. So, and by the way, I got to point out that we actually have someone on the tasting tonight for a New Zealand wine, and her nickname is Kiwi. <laughs> <laughs> I was so excited, Kiwi. Like, We're going to my place. <laughs> I've also not ever been to New Zealand. I worked for someone who was from Australia, and she was amazing. So she laughs every time I tell her my nickname is Kiwi. Yeah. So. <laughs> So, which we changed the name tonight to "House the Tannins" because I saw like that. Yeah, so that was great. <laughs> I mean, those are oh my gosh! <laughs> so much better now that it's not an icicle. It is, so, yeah. Sure. I'm going to ask you guys. I'm sure it's opened up because even for us, it's opened up. Mm -hmm. time it's yeah. When it was like super chilled, like refrigerator chilled, it was more like a, just a canned wine, kind of just like something mm. popped really good. Mm. It tasted a lot like the spell spellbound, mm. you know. Because it's uh, cool. Uh, Petite Syrah. 
But um, and you're right because it because it's cold. But as that warms up, <laughs> but, it's next to a pinot kiwi. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> so, but Jerry said that's why he poured it early because he wanted right. it to go ahead and open up oh, yeah. before he. Mm -hmm. well, and this quality, this quality will definitely do that. Um, can we uh, let's go into the? This is 100% pinot noir, no blending going on in here. Um, you want to share? Yeah, you know, let's go ahead and share and go through. I'm going to look at the map of New Zealand. All right, so. Everybody here is New Zealand, and there are different wine growing areas. Marlborough is here at the northern tip of the southern island, and that is where all of these grapes are sourced. But that's not where the winery is? The winery is actually right here. Oh, okay. I've had it a little bit memorized, even though you can't see me, so. <laughs> all right, so let's go on. This is specifically Marlborough. New Zealand and you can see again where Marlboro in general is and this is Marlboro specifically. So Blenheim over here is where the winery is and uh, the winemaker actually um, sources from 10 different locations around um, around Marlboro and Every single one of those uh, areas, every one of those people, he only sources from 10 different families that he's known for 20 years or more each. And he's been venting for 40 years. Um, all of his grapes are hand-picked. They're aged 11 months in oak barrels. And they actually gently bring them to the winery to make sure they're not pre-crushed on the, on, the, uh, on the route. And every single one of those 10 different vineyards is all sustainable. So every bit of this is sustainably grown. Wow. So uh, let's jump back quick to us. Oh, okay. So here's the thing. I just threw out a term sustainably grown. I'm assuming I was thinking somebody might wonder, hey, all right, what does that mean? So sustainably grown is not necessarily organic. Uh, it can be. Um, but it's more of a system in which they make sure that they do not deplete the ecosystem or pollute the ecosystem. So when they get done, so they, in the end, at the end of every growing cycle, the, all of the earth in that area has been re-energized and re, you know, uh, nourished to be able to go to the next year without taking anything from the system. So that's kind like of a, even. yeah, it, that's a very general, because there's no, Sustainable can mean a lot of different things. And some people say sustainable and they go all the way to, to, you know, organic and biodynamic. And some people even go through actually doing um, this one in California that does a full moon um, ritual every, every year in order to energetically reinvigorate their uh, grapes. My people. So, <laughs> I mean, that sounds very California. Yeah, right. <laughs> It's, actually, you know, I think we're going to have to drink that wine just yes. so I can cover that. Right? <laughs> There's so many great stories. Once again, this is why I love wine so much, because it tells a story. <clears throat> can we go back to the map? We can't. <laughs> I'm having fun. I the view is horrible up there. All right, so, so here we are with, um, the, so back to Marlboro. Um, the ABV on this guy is 13 and a half percent. So that's um that's solid above average for Pinot Noir, especially cold growth. So he, he um the winemaker here actually um, picks uh, he picks grapes from a selection of areas, some of the colder areas to get more of the spice and earth, and warmer areas to get the deep color and the rich fruit flavor. So uh, one thing that I think is interesting is that New Zealand makes a, you know, you look at it and you think about, especially with Sauv Blanc, New Zealand, you think New Zealand makes a lot of wine. New Zealand actually only produces 1% of the worldwide volume of wine. Really? Yep. They produce 1%. And their total land mass is only slightly larger than Oregon alone. For the wine so regions or no, for, for all, the, of New Zealand? all of New Zealand is just slightly larger than Oregon. And yet they have 50,000 acres of Sauvignon Blanc planted. Pinot Noir is the close follower thereafter. I didn't get the size on that. But they actually dominate the world market in Sauvignon Blanc. Huh. And just that I love those 
Um, what um, now the Marlboro region is known for is this combination of the ocean currents coming through, but there's enough protection because it has the North Island that they create wines that are really aromatic. So the big thing that they expect from their wine is what we were talking about is the aromatics jump out of the glass. So when you smell this wine, you don't have to search for a scent. It comes with a complexity of aromas and they jump right out. Yeah, now that it's warming up, like definitely. Mm -hmm. Like definitely. The name Astrolabe um, is I based it's on. This temperature is perfect. Uh, I guess we'll go to me. I think what's next. Um, we'll go back to me and then we'll again. All right, so the name Astrolabe comes from the, um, well, originally it was the, the nautical instrument that allowed people to find, um, find latitude while they were sailing. But the French explorer Dumont d'Urville actually charted the Marlboro Coast in a ship named the Astrolabe. So the mapping of the Marlboro Coast all came from this gentleman. Astrolabe was the name of the ship, and that's why they decided to, um, to, to, yeah, to name it that. Um, can we switch back now? So, all right, let's go to the next one. All right, so uh, here I go. This is a Marlboro vineyard. I mean, yeah, look at Marlboro views. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> wow. So we all can end. go someday. Right. Yeah. How about a How about a tipples? You know, fly <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, I think uh, people have talked about Tipple's wine tours. Yeah. Wine tours. Yeah. Uh, sign up on it together and get like a third party to plan it and then get an X number of seats. Wait, other countries are letting Americans into their countries again? Yes. Yeah, that would well, we would do that. Awesome. I yeah. think we would do that. Yes. <laughs> that would be great, right? So when the time comes, we need to plan that. I agree. I agree, Harry. <laughs> For sure. So this is one of the vineyards that's more inland because okay. you can see that you have the, the ridge of mountains goes through the center of the island. And then this next one, this is where it's going toward. Now the ocean is on the far side of that ridge of mountains. And the ocean is on the other side of the mountains. Of the other side of the mountains okay. here. So the other ones were inland mountains. This okay. is the, the ridge. So the, there's a valley in between where they grow. And then you get another ridge of mountains before you get to the ocean. And what I think is kind of cool that we're seeing here, and we've seen this in Oregon, we've seen this um, on the coast of Sonoma, is you see this again where the fog comes over, cools off the vineyards at night, and helps make better wine grapes. Mm -hmm. so, so literally all the way up to those mountains range is vineyard? Yes. Looks like a cornfield. It's like that's all the same. Like, Mosul Valley. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, I love the, the repeating... Uh, you know what we're seeing again and again is this mm -hmm. this coolness coming from uh, right. from the ocean the blanket. that helps make such beautiful mm -hmm. beautiful grapes. It's geography that we do not see oh, here at all. Right. Ever. Yes. I know. It makes me so sad. <laughs> I want to leave. So, so uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, Astrolabe is a family-owned uh, winery. They weren't originally. Originally, it was uh, Simon Wagner. And he had a couple of business partners, but he was the winemaker. He was in control. They were there for help financially. He since bought them out. So it is now completely family owned. Hmm. And, um, and, they, and they had a picture. Here we go. Here's, here's the Waghorn family. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. So if, if you guys don't know, these are hobbits from the Lord of the Rings Tolkien Cheers. movies. But it was shot in New Zealand. It was. So. <laughs> I couldn't help it. I was in New Zealand. Perfect, Jeff. Perfect. Thank you so much. Does it come in pints? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, it does. <laughs> okay, so here's the Waghorn family. Oh, I get it now. <laughs> <laughs> so Simon Waghorn, um, here's, here's his quote. I thought it's like, he chose to live in Marlboro because he honestly believes that they're the best and most aromatic grapes in the world and they truly excite him to work so with. So it's like an Aussie. Yeah. <laughs> so, and he works and he plays around. He knows every one of the subregions and how they're going to play and he creates his cuvee, whether it's for his Sal Blanc or for his Pinot Noir. So I just think it's really amazing that you have this family running around on a tractor and they literally do. You should look at their website. Mm -hmm. And they actually, they take all these cool pictures of the woods and everything around their home 
because they love it there. And that's where they've grown up. These girls, these are two of his three daughters, and they're both beginning to run the family business now. That's awesome. Yeah, you know, we're on the other side of the world talking about them. Mm -hmm. Exactly. <laughs> so really, I, I think it's great. Mm -hmm. Um, and I mentioned to you that everyone that Simon works with to grab, to get grapes from around the area, um, there's only 10 families. Every one of them is sustainable. He's known them for over 20 years. This is, these are some of his actual vineyards rather than the other pictures were Marlboro in general. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of what we're drinking came from here. And these are the ones that are hand-picked? It's the third row yes. on the right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, but no, they're they're yeah. all hand picks that go right. into the every yeah. single every single one hand picks. Right. Um, it, it's a much more gentle process, mm -hmm. and and think about the fact that you've got people that are biodynamically growing, going the extra mile to make it so that it's not hurting their the, the earth to grow their grapes. Mm -hmm. They're hand picking the grapes, right. hand carrying them back over to the vineyard, and it gets across the world, and. Where were we? 20 bucks on this? Yeah, that's amazing. That's awesome. It's so is it because they're doing that much of it? If they're able to do that much, they're able to do it at Actually, that their, their production is not small, but it's not huge. It's kind of an in-between. But um, the efficiencies of, uh, you know, available in the world truly baffle me sometimes. Because it would seem to be that if it's here, because of the shipping, it'd be much less there than... Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So even though they're going through all of this trouble to make sure that they're making right. a good wine and they're making it responsibly. Right. Mm -hmm. right. They are. They are. And you know, I think it's, I don't know, I, just, I, I like, I think it's exciting to be able to drink something. I mean, they're, you know, Simon is there with his daughters and they, they tasted this before mm -hmm. they sent it out. And it's a taste of what Simon does and the relationship he's made and the right. relationship the family has and those other families with what they're producing. And here we are in Florida, mm -hmm. enjoying Gainesville. Yeah. Gainesville, Florida. Gainesville, Florida. Gainesville, yeah. yeah. Wherever that is. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, right, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> We're avoiding the hurricanes drinking wine. Yes, exactly. <laughs> oh, really? We do have an approaching hurricane, don't we? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm I'm supposed to go to Miami, and I'm like, maybe I shouldn't go. <laughs> Family vineyards. You know, right. as opposed to just um, like the larger vineyards that are really like corporate. Like corporate, yes. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Right. No, I I agree. I, it is really wonderful. I mean, and not that the bigger guys can't produce great things. We all love the Eagle Dog. Mm -hmm. You know, and they are French negotiants, so they're a big company buying a lot of wonderful grapes. But even they have relationships. <laughs> That's what the grapes were based on. It was forty years of relationships for Eagle Gall as well. Uh, but they are much bigger. Um, and uh, the, big anyway, just, with the big guys, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, they are, and, and they make it all the way here. And I think that they're just, they're just much more fun to drink when you could think if I ever go to New Zealand, the 10 to 12 cases a year that I buy of this wine, and when you add the, add the Sal Blanc on there, so 24 cases, maybe 30 cases a year that we buy from them will matter to them, mm -hmm. like. You know, they'll shake, they'll shake my hand and look me in the eye and say, thank you so much yeah. for buying those 30 cases. Instead of somebody's like, ah, you didn't get to a thousand. What are you? You're nothing. To yeah. <laughs> so I have a very basic question and it's probably like back to basics. But for me, it's like, so my favorite red style is Pinot Noir. Okay. What makes a Pinot Noir different from, obviously they taste very different from like a cab like from the actual process is it just it's a different grape is it where it's grown like is it aged differently it's like that's a good question it is it starts from the grape pinot noir is the most expensive grape to grow in the world oh it is the most finicky grape it has the huh. thinnest skin and because of that in order to get the flavors you want out of it you've got to treat it just right or not depending on what results you get um it's going to be there's a very small margin of error when you're working with Pinot Noir. So when people make beautiful Pinots, I give them incredible respect. And Burgundy is listening to this right now saying, yes, exactly. <laughs> the Burgundy region? The Burgundy region oh, as a whole. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's all right. Yes, you're right. Burgundy, <laughs> France, all of them are like, yes, we are the best. <laughs> <laughs> We're the greatest artisans. So is it, is it 
is it more than so obviously you said it's the way you treat the grape and everything right. it starts with the grape mm -hmm. and is there more the process is that different too because that's what john asked as well well there is like it it is it there's a smaller area in the world that's good for growing it because it needs a very specific area of climate because it does need mm -hmm. cooler growth to really thrive appropriately uh cooler growth and if you want to get all the really beautiful nuanced flavors out of it it takes gentle handling so that hand-picked thing. I mean, there are plenty of Pinots out of California that taste nothing, no, not nothing like this, but not a lot like this. Because they they just, they run a machine down and they grab all the Pinot grapes and they were warm grown and you can make wine out of them, it's fine, but it, it doesn't give the spirit that is Pinot. And that, and that is what, is what like grabbed you, John, for example. There There is a well-grown Pinot. I honestly, before I really, studied wine and became a sommelier trained um, wine drinker and, and wine, uh, you know, a buyer. I didn't think I liked Pinot because I was drinking yeah. Pinots that weren't well made. <laughs> mm -hmm. Especially they, they after Sideways, nothing. there was a lot of bad ones. <laughs> <laughs> so a follow-up is then, um, does, is there such thing as like a Pinot blend? It's like, oh, yeah. because I've seen like, like I, for instance, I, I don't know, I don't even know if they, or care if they produce one, but like say Barefoot, if they say like, we make a Pinot in the water, oh. is that, do they you see do this grimace, Barefoot? Yeah, exactly. Well, I'm, I'm thinking like the cheap wine. <laughs> I have no poker face. <laughs> I have no poker face when it comes to cheap wine. <laughs> um, he set you up saying it was an interesting question. So, <laughs> so but do they? Do they do like Pinot Noir blends or something? And if it's like a certain percentage of Pinot Noir, they can say it's a Pinot Noir or? Oh, no, do they ever. And they're the most <laughs> popular Pinot Noir sold in the United States, has Petite Syrah in it and drinks like a very tasty red blend, but it doesn't drink like Pinot Noir at all. But it's it not, not what we're like having. Pinot Noir. But it is technically Pinot because of the percentages. But the wine that they blended in for the last 15% is California requires 85%. So the last 15% is all Petite Syrah, which is one of the heaviest wines in, that you can make. It drinks like a red blend. And I'm not that saying- That is called Petite Syrah? Is that yes. heavy Hey, well, I can tell you about that, actually. <laughs> it is the Petite Syrah. The smaller the grape, that means the more surface area of the grape is skin, and the flavor and intensity comes from the skin. So the more surface area to juice ratio, the bigger the wine. And that's why Petite Syrah with small berries makes really big wine. Can we change my nickname to Petite Kiwi? So the smaller the person, the bigger the personality. That's cute. <laughs> So as long as, so like, say if I'm a winemaker and I just want to make a Pinot Noir for the cheapest possible, so I could blend it with something that as long as it's 85 or majority Pinot Noir, I right. can say it's a Pinot Noir. That's right. The way, those are California That's standards. That's California standards. It's different in okay. other areas. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, obviously. And, and by the way, there are some Pinot blends out there. Here, here's a famous Pinot Noir blend. Champagne. Champagne, Champagne is a Pinot Noir blend. It's Pinot and Chardonnay. I hate Isn't Chardonnay. It? Oh, <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> you think you do, but you go to the French. So not all Champagne has Pinot in it, but the majority does. Unless it's called Blanc de Blanc, then it has Pinot in it. So Brut, Chardonnay, which is most. Can I interrupt you just a moment? Yeah. And just a reminder that if it's Champagne, it has to be from champagne. champagne. Otherwise, yeah. it's sparkling wine. Right. Yes. Yeah. So, okay. okay, cool. So go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, because that is some Your husband idea. made sure that we look, knew look, that. I, I promised myself. He, right. He wasn't going to refer to champagne. <laughs> he, like, refer to sparkling wine as champagne. But right. lay people, we right. refer to right. all sparkling so, wines as champagne. Yeah. And, and <laughs> I don't, don't want to go all wine. Dude. I did that once at Tipples. I'll never do it again. Yeah. Yes, right. Did he throw a cork at you? Yeah. Like, Don't <laughs> call it unless it's from Champagne, France. Uh, uh, uh. Okay, so now go right, ahead. So, <laughs> champagne comes in brut. So you're going to have a combination of Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. It comes in Blanc de Blanc, which is all Chardonnay. 
and it comes in Blanc de Noir, which is all Pinot. Do you have any of those at the store? Oh yeah, I have all of them. Cool. Looks like I have my weekend plan. Girl, please. <laughs> Why is it white then? Because they take the skins off. Awesome. Well, we drank a white Pinot Noir. Remember a couple weeks ago? Oh yeah, that was very good. Yeah, yeah. So it's a matter of skin contact and okay. keeping it minimal. So yeah, that's how they. You're killing me. It. You're killing me, Jeff. <laughs> I, I have a Pinot question. I've been to a couple of tastings of just Pinot Noirs, and they talk about um, oh, I'm blanking on the name, like the chromes or the chromosomes, or um, I'm blanking on the oh, term. The, um, I, I know what you're talking about. It's the um, no, I'm blanking on it. <laughs> I know what you're it's it's the, it's the clippings that they took it from. Mm -hmm. of the original vines. It's the, and I don't uh, hear that with any other grape other than Pinot Noir. It does exist for all the grapes, but they talk about it the most with Pinot and Chardonnay, which goes back to Burgundy because Burgundy is really, really strict about what they grow. Okay. And, well, so what yeah. is the, like, hold on, what, what is it's, the um, They go back to the, I can't, Not I'm blanking. Not chromosomes, but get it's, with no, it's the it's the clone, the clone Clones, number. That's it, yeah. That's why you eat chromosomes. <laughs> right, right. And honestly, it has something to do with the chromosomes, so it makes yeah. total sense that you would go there. So they have, they have clippings that they take in order to propagate the grapes, and then they will go to certain famous areas within France and clip it, and so they call it, they actually have named some of the clones um, in there so that you're, they'll take it and they'll even go to Oregon and say, oh, this is the clone of, Burgundy, you know, blah, blah, blah. And you can then trace it back to its origin over in Burgundy and think, oh, wow, that's, that's, that's some amazing, amazing uh, wine. So it must be some amazing grapes. And then you go from there. But um, it, you, it does technically exist across the board, uh, but they talk about it most from Burgundian um, grapes, which would be Pinot and, and Chardonnay. So pretty much if you're buying in the U.S., like, say, like obviously I only go to tipples, but if I went somewhere else and I ask them, is this a hundred percent Pinot Noir and the, or whatever, I'd look it up online. Then that means that wine is like very difficult to grow process. And yeah. It's, it's, like, it's going to be, it's definitely going to be more difficult in order to get you the final result, because if they make it out of hundred percent Pinot, they really need to be buying better grapes. Cause if mm -hmm. you buy, if you buy garbage Pinot grapes grown, grown in warm areas and then, you throw in a little bit of deep Syrah and Chardonnay as a combination of balancing it out with some acidity and then some richness, then you might end up and get something that's actually pretty tasty. But so we're just going to start growing some Pinot Noir grapes in our backyard, and then we'll throw in some Syrah and some Chardonnay. Yeah, Florida, that would all turn into. I'm sure they love the gains of weather that we've been having. So. <laughs> yeah, it would. It would just be a big pile of mildew. They can't. <laughs> Oh, I've okay, got something good. really fun. I got like this cool bonus section that I'm going to sh show you guys today. So you know how I've been lately, um, being chair. Yeah. That's a sharing on his own. Hooray. Oh, you yeah. can do it. Go, check. There you go. Got it. Si podemos. <laughs> All right. So, <clears throat> you know, I've been doing the wine scores thing at the end of uh, each one, just kind of keep showing it because I think it is important to understand that. And we talked about some of the pluses and minuses last week of this scoring system, you know, that 50 is kind of the lowest, why is zero not the lowest? And, and then one of the other things that they talk about is that it is subjective and that there can be variation. For example, I was looking at, um, I was looking at a couple of mal, no, uh, cab francs this week. And I was looking at one cab franc that was rated 98 points, amazing, in the oh. same vintage when it was also rated 90 points. Wow, that's a big difference. So you think that's a big difference? You go to classic to outstanding. Mm -hmm. Oh, hold my beer. Let's look at this one. So today I had a wine rep come in and this is potentially a very good one. I'm not slamming the wine or the wine rep. But so this wine, the Wapisa, is a Pinot Noir from Southern Argentina and the Patagonia region. So the Patagonia region in there in Southern Argentina is a plateau that's a really cool growth area and makes some beautiful Pinot Noirs. And they're usually really nicely, nicely um, priced as well in the mm -hmm. 20s. 
So this one piece is, so they said, oh, it's a James Suckling 94 pointer. I'm like, okay, great. Well, I'm doing some research. Let me talk about the two things I found here. Yeah. So let's read James Suckling real quick. 94 points, a fresh and clean Pinot Noir, fresh strawberries, hints of flowers, medium bodied, mm -hmm. crisp and vivid, beautiful finish, shows focus and finesse. First Pinot Noir from this winemaker that he's had, drink or hold, meaning you can age it, 94 points. So we go up here, 94, that's an outstanding wine, right? Let's go to the wine enthusiast version. Same vintage, same exact wine. 83 points. Wow. <laughs> so candied floral aromas are only lightly suggestive of what a Pinot Noir normally smells like. A chunky palate is aimless and obtuse, while raspberry and plum flavors are thin and taste oddly of chicken fat and cherry Kool-Aid. How would I like it is? Holy crap! <laughs> <laughs> it out. No, I did not taste you it. She just told me I have not. I can't tell that, you. That's my question. Are you going to try a bottle just to? I'm, I'm intrigued now. I got to know, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. Is just stuff, protect us from the chicken. Is it amazing or yeah. disgusting? Which is why no. I. Drink. <laughs> amazing or no. disgusting? That's it. Right. Right. That one comes with a brown bag. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> We're under the interstate, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. He's just sitting so, on the um, corner. Right. Oh my gosh, I thought that was. <laughs> Which ratings do you pay attention to? In the past, I always thought. Wine Spectator or Robert Parker. And now there's so many different ratings out there. Mm -hmm. Who has the best ones? Um, let me see here. These are the ones that I pay attention to. Where's my things? Right. Oh, I had my listing of who I paid attention to on here and I must have deleted it when I moved over to this week. Well, we get the Wine Spectator at the house. Right. So, so I pay attention to both of these guys. Uh, so. Wine Spectator, James Suckling, Wilfred Wong, Wine Enthusiast, um, Ventus, Decanter. Um, there, there are a couple of other people that um, that I do. So they're like eight people. They're probably eight wine. or ten that I do. And um, I actually had them listed here and I, I accidentally deleted it. Normally these guys are much closer. Hmm. Uh, I mean, this is just, this yeah, amused that's me. Yeah, that's it's, pretty, um, yeah. This so I'll just in... say to a Jeff and a Jake. And there you go. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah I, well, and, and that goes to show you, I guess maybe it goes to show you a little bit too, is that I don't take everything for granted just because they throw a number at me. I do my additional research mm -hmm. uh, because I just- A second description is a very Jake description of stuff sometimes. Yes. Right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So, oh my God. but that's why you taste it. <laughs> in the yeah. store. Mm -hmm. right. Well, you know, it's just like, Remember I was talking about the, uh, the Pinot Noir that was blended with uh, Petit Syrah, mm -hmm. and it's the number one selling Pinot in the country. Um, I have, it? it's Mayomi. Oh, Mayomi. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. That's the one my people like too much. A lot of people like it, which is fine. I, it tastes good. I, I'm not saying it doesn't taste good. I'm saying it doesn't taste like Pinot. Mm -hmm. So I have a suggestion maybe for future tastings might be kind of cool. Is that the end of the tasting? Yeah, sorry, if you can sorry. find mm -hmm. what I'm those are like wine spectators and all the other guys are saying sorry, about sorry, that wine, yeah. that's yeah. very live slide. All right, here's what you guys said. Here's what we talked mm -hmm. about. Here's mm -hmm. what oh, yeah. these guys said about it. Yeah, that'd be fun. Mm -hmm. You're right. That'd be yeah, I, I yeah, can only do it. I've been thinking about that. creating like the, the I've been thinking about Jeff you know, creating the Jeff and Jake rating system as it was. <laughs> I thought it'd be kind of fun. Uh, <laughs> or even a subsection just saying these are some of my favorites, these are some of Jake's mm -hmm. favorites, these are some of Mike's favorites. Mm -hmm. That's uh, actually a, a good thing. <laughs> yeah. I think that's Yeah, good. I think it is. Oh, by the yeah. way, Jake finally tasted uh, do you guys remember drinking Lema Strong? Yes. I do. The one with Eddie. Eddie was in the tasting. Oh, yes. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. the, the red blend from um, Monterey, California. It's delicious. So I knew Jake would love this wine. And Jake finally drank it today. And he looks at me, he's like, screw you, Jeff. It's amazing. Yeah, I was like, yeah. <laughs> no, no, that's different. Oh, okay. that's different. Yeah. But he kn it annoyed him that I know his taste so well. And I was like, yeah, you're going to sell them all now. It's fine. <laughs> it was very good. That was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned some of the more expensive uh, Pinots, like from Oregon. So what makes those different than what we're drinking now? Not, we're talking apples and oranges here, but um, why are those black 
and so heavy, heavy ones. more like a Malbec or something. And, and these are lighter, and you can get even lighter ones, you know, the ones you can see through uh, Pinot's. Is it all the same grape? Is it the quality of the environment? What, what would you attribute that to? It, it actually has, it, it's a good question, Jerry, and it comes down to multiple aspects, um, which, you know, when they say wine's complex, which is why we talk about it so much. Um, or you could argue we just pretend to talk about it <laughs> while we get to it. But, um, but like we know what we're doing. so extraction levels are a combination of the temperature of the location, the terroir of the location, so the, the quality of the soil, because higher nutrient levels and higher temperatures are going to give you uh, more fruit and more dark colors into your wine. But it also tends to do with also how much, so if they don't get a lot of rain right before they pick the grapes, you're going to have darker, darker um, grape, darker wine, because you've got less water that's gone in there. Okay. And basically, it literally waters down the grapes because the first thing that the, the um, that the the um, the grape um, the grape plants want to do when they get rained on is throw it into the you know, throw it into the fruit. Do that because their whole point is in the fruit is reproducing themselves, and so they think the better the fruit, the better the chance that it's it's going to reproduce. So. And then the whole time the winemakers are fighting with the plant trying to stress it out because they want it to create the highest quality, most fruit. intense fruit. So they want to, um, they want to give it lower nutritional values, but not too low and certainly lower water because they don't, they, they want a, a nice flavorful grape. So if we have a darker Pinot Noir, mm -hmm. is that a better Pinot Noir? No, 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 it's no, not, not necessarily, uh, not necessarily. And okay. depending on what they're going for, depending on what style you like better. Okay. So, all right, so we'll go into Burgundy, for example. Burgundy, France, is considered the world standard of making Pinot Noirs, and none of them like dark. Yeah. You can see through all of them. They're all very light, easy to see through. You know, pretty a pretty granite, garnet color, um, but you can see right through them, but they have nice, intense flavors uh, and, and a lot of earth. So, they don't want to have a dark Pinot. But then you get over to California and Californians like to go with a darker Pinot with a little more fruit. And they like to have, a lot of the classic Californian Pinots prefer to have um, a more barrel effect. And that's where you get your Pinot Noir with some more baking spices and allspice mm -hmm. and a little bit of vanilla flavor to it instead of earthy flavors. And my opinion is they're both delicious. Just depends on which day of the week you want to drink it on. <laughs> I, I think they're both really beautiful expressions of Pinot, but they are very, but neither one is wrong. Unless yeah. you live in France and Burgundy and they will tell you which one is wrong. <laughs> right. French. Yeah. Wait, the French are judgmental when it comes to wine? <laughs> I don't know. I, evidently, I was meant to be a wine guy yeah. with my French last name. Yes. So. <laughs> so, and Jeff, so last question from Marcel. Judge side. like a Frenchman. There you go. So the, the Astrolab, the this this winery do they have like a signature like because i know like the catanias they like they do like the red sash or whatever they put on their favorite vines do they oh, have right. a label that is considered like this is what we're proudest of this is what we want they to get they do but they don't yes. export it right now oh really so, yeah so on our wine tour to new zealand <laughs> yeah then we can right. try that <laughs> exactly I love it. So, do you guys want to see what we're going to drink next week? Yeah, why not? Let's see what I'm going to cook. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. We're going to drink the Wapasa. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> next week, we're going back to Spain. Ooh. We're going to drink the Baron Delay Museum Reserva. So, we're going to the most famous area oh, within yeah. Spain. Good old Rioja. They're all Tempranillo grapes. Mm. Uh, and we will discuss what grapes are used in Rioja, what are the different quality slash style representations. They've got Crianza, Reserva, Grand Reserva, and then what makes this guy special because this is a specially made wine for the United States from huh. this, this group. Uh, it, it, it's a great wine. It's one of my favorites. I'm buying the last three cases in the States so that we can have enough to taste next week. <laughs> I do what I do. 
Um, and so these guys, great parents, lamb, pork, roast chicken, chorizo, and robust sausages. Well, if you did your Boston butt, would it go with that? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. oh, be really good. That would be all right. Robust sausage. Oh, yeah. Almost need to get some sausage. So uh, oh, yeah. to get some sausage. Mm -hmm. Dry cured ham, how about that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Any of those. Mm. You can yeah, get a good sandwich for five bucks. It's one of the coolest little wines that I'm able to bring in the store, and I, I love that wine. It's fantastic. What price range are we talking there? About the same? 20 you know, the crazy thing is you, it starts in the upper 20s. With all of that, I mean, anyway, we'll get into all the different aging that they have to do in the, in the mm -hmm. high level. Yeah. But uh, it's Spanish yeah. wine. Spanish wines are crazy good deals. Yeah. So... Yeah. This, yeah. this wine, which hits, you know, it, it's, I would call it a 90 plus pointer, which is my kind of phrase for it. It's 90, 91, 90, 91, <laughs> when they get it you know, rated. So call it a, a solid, outstanding wine. And it really is uh, for under $30. And yeah, it's good. It's just, it's delicious. It's really great. And, uh, mm. and it's different. So uh, I'm excited. I'm excited to share that with you guys. Next week. So hope everyone will come back again. Yeah. Does anybody have any more comments about tonight's one? I it's like good. it a lot. It's now that it's open up and it's warmer, you like it? <laughs> no, so talking about pairings, I made a shepherd's pie with lamb and, and grass-fed beef tonight. Nice. And on purple uh, organic potatoes. That's uh, really cool. I really this love. tasted great with it. So. I bet it did. No, that sounds Wait, where did you get your purple organic potatoes? Oh wait, they weren't, were they organic? No, they were just regular. Oh, they're regular. Where did you get the purple no, but you potatoes? can find the organic ones. Oh, wait a minute. Lucky's doesn't exist or nor does Earth Fair anymore. Mm. I bet you Whole Foods does. I know one of them has them in town. I've been trying to find them since we, we were at, um, for our, our 40th, we went to Amelia Island, to the Ritz. Okay. We went yes, to, sir. there's they have a restaurant called Salt in the Ritz there, and they made yeah. the best, Purple potatoes, purple sweet potatoes, right? Oh, were they purple purple sweet potatoes? I think they were purple sweet potatoes. They were okay. Whole you can find those. Yes. I'll so. check our Whole Foods tomorrow. You remember that? Yeah, check the Whole Foods and see. That sounds amazing. Like, I went with my other yeah. husband. <laughs> Do you ever go to Aldi's? Because Aldi's on the organic side. You know, the far side is the organic side. Sometimes they have a mixture of um, potatoes and they have purple, red, the red ones and then the gold one. Okay. I'll, have I'll check both for you, Elizabeth, tomorrow. And Thank, I'll you. Look. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There you go. <laughs> so what, what's, what's, the story with, what's the story with the food trucks the next couple of days? So um, tomorrow, normally we would have Sublime Taco, but he had to cancel uh, this week because uh, it is finals week for students and he had so many people take off work Evidently, he employs a lot of local students. Ah, so he uh, called up very butter. apologetically. We had him last Wednesday. Yeah. He will be back next Wednesday. Cool. And we do it's have Sunday, Kenny on right? Thursday. Kenny will be here. Sveganona Pizza will be here on Thursday. Thursday. Okay. Is Sin with Sublime? Is... Yes. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah, Sin with Sublime. Sam oh, my gosh. Sublime. By the way, his new menu, you've got to come next Wednesday. Is oh, it? It's so good. He has a, he has a um, short rib taco now. Oh, wow. And the scallop oh, nice. taco. <laughs> oh, yeah, scallops are fantastic. Wow. Oh, I love scallops. Scallop pork ribs. Wow. So, what have been outside of the We have not heard the final confirmation. Okay. So, keep, you know, stay tuned. We may have some. But we did have our charcuterie delivered today. Oh, well, that's yeah. right. So, so <laughs> if, you know, if you're, in, what the county told me, if you're seated and eating, and buying legitimate food, not just opening up a package of pretzels okay. from us, mm -hmm. that that counts as being restaurant -y enough that it counts. And so you can sit inside, or you can always sit outside. You can sit outside without food. Right. As long as you're socially distanced. Mm -hmm. um, and if you, you know, get up and come in, you have to put your mask on. Yeah. Um, and, and if you're seated inside, mm -hmm. you have to, you can, you can drink as long as you're eating, like you just said. Right. The minute you stand up, you have to put your mask on. Your mask Going to the bathroom on. or something, then you're putting your mask on. So, oh, but as long as you're eating or drinking, you can have your mask off to, to eat or drink. So, right. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We'll all get through this together and- Roll uh, with the punches, yeah. yep. Yep, yep exactly. Yeah. Everyone's been yeah. doing a much better job of, uh -huh. of trying to, well, yeah. like, 
you know, like um, was it, the Surgeon General said, masks will turn into freedom. So Absolutely. I'm like, okay, then let's do it. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. I think it's a small sacrifice to make, especially. I mean, I look at it this way: our healthcare professionals are struggling. You know, Extreme. not necessarily maybe here, but across the country. And so I guess it's just like we all have to lead by example. Exactly. Well, it trickles. It trickles because you know, if it's too big in Jacksonville, they come to Gainesville. If it's too big in yeah. Orlando, they come to Gainesville. So you're absolutely that's, right. That's been. You know, I have a lot of clients where their parents are doctors. It does, uh, and literally from cardio. A Pete's cardio all the way to internal medicine and these people don't even breathe in it. I've had my other clients the parents are nurses and they're doing double shifts because this one got sick. I mean, it is, it's here. It, it, it's here and it yeah. is taking a big toll yes. on our, our health system and it's, it's very, very scary. Yeah, it is. It is. It is. Right. Yep. So we all do our part and we we get to stay open. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You know, thank you all foremost. for your continued support because if people don't support local, then we can't get through it. So yeah. That's right. We're glad we're, we're sure glad you're here. Well, thank you. Thank you. I hope to be here for the We're grateful time. for you. That's we're right. grateful for you. Oh, all right. All right. Yes. On this love fest, let's all toast out. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Tasting. You can all hang out afterward, but we'll stop recording. Okay. Okay.